Okay, okay, just hear me out. What if we shot it into the sun? Foster asked excitedly. You are aware just how far away the sun actually is, right? His fellow researcher, Reese, replied, sighing with exhaustion at their lengthy conversation. They had been discussing this for so long that the food on both their trays had gone unappetizingly cold. Obviously, but okay, think about it. We'd be sending it into a perpetually burning nuclear furnace. There is no way it would be able to survive. Researcher Foster rebutted, standing by his latest harebrained theory. We'd send it up into a rocket, fully automated, so no personnel have to put themselves in harm's way and sacrifice their lives, then boom, it flies into the sun, problem solved. So, it never occurred to you that 682 might figure out a way to escape on the 150 million kilometer journey? Reese poked at his mashed potatoes with a fork out of boredom. You're forgetting how intelligent the thing is. It might be an omnicidal killing machine, but it's as smart as either of us. Well, one of us, to say the least. Sitting opposite each other in the mess hall, Researcher Foster and Researcher Reese kept up their bickering, debating on what would be the best way to neutralize SCP-682, the infamous, hard-to-destroy reptile. It was a discussion nearly every member of Foundation personnel had been a part of at least once. How could they kill this unkillable beast? What other anomalies were they yet to try and use against it? Even after countless tests, most leading to numerous containment breaches and significant loss of life, the Foundation seemed to be no closer to putting a definitive end to SCP-682. But while Reese and Foster debated more and more outlandish possibilities, someone was sitting nearby listening in on every word. At a table, all by himself in the mess hall, a man in typical Foundation security officer garb was quietly scrawling everything the pair of researchers were saying on a notepad. The photo identification and name tag he wore on his uniform identified him as one Elias Anderson, a long-serving member of the SCP Foundation, with an extensive service record logged in their personal database. Of course, that name and the whole identity were just a cover. The real officer Elias Anderson was dead, his body being kept on ice, hidden in a morgue within a secure black site. It hadn't taken long for the man now wearing Anderson's uniform and using his name to update the officer's photo with one of his own face in the Foundation's database, keeping his subterfuge so far undetected. Gathering up his notepad, casually hiding it under his tray as he stood up and walking towards the mess hall exit, the unknown infiltrator made his way to the nearest elevator, riding it up to the highest level, making sure any other passengers had gotten out on other floors. The security officer flipped the emergency stop switch. He reached into his pocket, retrieving a jury-rigged handheld communication device, and began sending a message on a secure channel. Agent Parados checking in, he wrote. The SCP Foundation is still bickering amongst themselves about the best way to eliminate the target. SCP-682 remains contained but alive. Advise best course of action. The cursor on screen blinked for a few seconds, awaiting a response. Excellent work, Agent. The reply from GOC Command finally arrived, lines of text scrolling rapidly across the screen. As long as this anomaly is allowed to live, it poses an ever-present life to all threat on Earth. What is your assessment of the Foundation's approach to termination? Parados thought to himself for a moment before sending back, they're overthinking it. Affirmative, the Coalition wrote. Have the O5 Council still denied termination of SCP-682 via nuclear weapons? The undercover agent quickly responded, confirming that this was indeed still the case. There was another pause, almost like the whole GOC was thinking carefully about what to do next. Global Occult Coalition executives have conferred in private to authorize a hammer-down operation to eliminate the anomaly known as SCP-682 came the follow-up from command. An F-22 Raptor fixed with a 60-megaton payload will be launched at 0600, bound for the following coordinates. A map reference quickly followed, the longitude and latitude of a large empty area of the Pacific Ocean. Agent Parados, your new objective is to lure the creature into the open by any means necessary. GOC, out. Slipping the communicator back into his pocket, Parados unclicked the elevator's stop switch, and pressed one of the numbered floor buttons. He already knew which one would take him back down to 682's containment cell, and what to do when he got there. The commotion was unlike anything Parados had ever seen before. Alarms were blaring so loud that the sound was ringing in his ears. Most of the research staff were fleeing for their lives, while heavily armed mobile task force operatives in tactical gear were moving in formation to support the security personnel. Some had abandoned their posts out of sheer terror, desperately looking for anywhere they could hide in order to stay alive. 
Under the ear-splitting wail of alerts was a cacophony of chaos, a mix of hailing gunfire from the MTF's weapons, the crumble of walls as the facility around them was being torn apart, and the angered, vicious roars of the rampaging reptile. All hands were on deck. The Foundation, while always on high alert, had been caught completely unprepared for a containment breach. SCP-682 was making short work of any living personnel in its path, carving them up with its claws or devouring them while they were still alive, leaving a trail of blood and destruction in its wake. Any survivors on site were quickly instructed to retreat into the command center, and Parados casually slid in alongside a gaggle of panicked researchers. He recognized one of them from the mess hall, researcher Foster, wide-eyed and disassociating in shock, the blood of his colleague Rees still wet on his face and lab coat. The outer doors of the command center were locked down, while all efforts inside were put towards coordinating the recontainment effort, tracking the escaped anomaly's movements via a live satellite feed. Agent Parados had to think and act fast. The hard to destroy reptile was already making its way towards water, where GOC fighter jets would enrage it in order to make the anomaly follow them to the target area. But if the Foundation had a chance to recapture SCP-682, his entire mission would be declared a failure. Checking that nobody was watching, Parado snuck over to a computer terminal. Looking underneath, he located a panel and unscrewed it as quickly and inconspicuously as he could. Reaching for his communicator, he put the device into one of the ports underneath the terminal, and it instantly went to work, installing proprietary software that would block any outbound Foundation communication. Hey! Foster stammered, spotting Parado sabotaging the terminal. Hey! Hey! What is he doing? Within moments, the researcher had gained the attention of the surviving security personnel, who rushed over and tackled the saboteur. The officers restrained Parados, one grabbing each of his arms as they held him in place. But it was too late. Communication suddenly went offline, cutting the command center off from the rest of the Foundation. Who are you? One of the security guards yelled over and over again, punching the infiltrator in the gut each time. Who do you work for? Fighting through the pain, Parados had kept his jaw clenched so tightly that he could feel his teeth grinding together like they were about to crack. We still have access to all saved internal data. One of the Foundation technicians, a man named Baxter, chimed in after examining the computer terminal. According to this security footage, he's the one who sprung 682. Do, do we still have no comms? Foster asked timidly, still trying to wipe Reese's blood off of his coat. Negative, the technician answered. Whatever this device is, it's deactivated every way we have to transmit. We can still receive, though. His voice trailed off, reducing to match the low silence that was now filling the command center. Everyone in the room, including the restrained Agent Parados, had gradually turned to face the massive screens, displaying the satellite footage of SCP-682. It was small, but visible, thanks to how zoomed in the orbital lens was. The hard-to-destroy reptile had reached the water, and was making its way across the ocean. At the same time, the bird's-eye feed of the Pacific showed something else, a tiny, winged object barreling through the air at almost supersonic speeds. That's a fighter jet, one of the security guards declared, breaking the tense silence. Probably a raptor by the looks of it. It was, in fact, a fighter jet speeding towards SCP-682. The creature seemed unaware of the aircraft. It was merely traveling in the opposite direction, but the pair were on a direct course with each other, bound to meet at any moment now. Something ejected from the F-22 that exact moment it passed over the hard-to-destroy reptile, followed almost instantly by a bright flash of light. A huge explosion engulfed the area of the ocean where the creature had been, a ball of radioactive fire in the middle of the water. The Foundation personnel in the command center watched in horror at the nuclear detonation, holding their breath, dreading what they would see when the mushroom cloud dissipated. He's with the Coalition, the nearest security guard realized, referring to Parados. It was well known amongst the staff that the SCP Foundation maintained a somewhat fragile alliance with the Global Occult Coalition. While they had historically worked together when their goals aligned, the GOC were more intent on destroying anomalies wholesale, wiping them from existence in order to protect the United Nations and peoples of the world. The Foundation, on the other hand, although never afraid to get their hands dirty, but more of an emphasis on containment and study of anomalies rather than outright extermination. What the hell have you done, you maniac? yelled one of the doctors trapped in the command center. That monstrosity needed to be eliminated. Parados argued back. While you were wasting your time keeping it submerged in acid, ready for it to break out again and start slaughtering people, we acted. And look for yourselves, it worked. 
You should be thanking the GOC and me, because it turns out 682 wasn't invincible after all. No, it isn't, Foster spoke up. Reese and I were talking about it earlier. He said 682's greatest strength isn't being invulnerable, it's being adaptable. It can change itself, mutate in response to damage, or in order to survive a hostile environment, and you just, you haven't killed it. You've allowed it to adapt to a nuclear weapon. On the screens, something bursts from underneath the water. The overhead view from the satellite feed filled the display, an image of a dark, rocky surface. Who zoomed in on the feed? Pull it back! Baxter announced, trying to hide what they were all afraid of now. That the footage wasn't zoomed in at all, it was just looking at something much bigger now. As the camera zoomed out, increasing its field of view, what looked like a dark surface on screen now looked to be a huge mass of scales. The satellite feed pulled further back, revealing the full extent of what was now standing in the Pacific Ocean. It was SCP-682, not only still alive, but much, much bigger than before. The creature had adapted to the intense heat of the nuclear payload that had been dropped on it soaking up the bomb's radiation and using it as a way to increase its body mass several million times over. Um, it looks like we have, um, <clears throat> Baxter said dumbfounded, eyes widen in horror. A uh, kaiju on our hands. Parado stared up at the screen, looking at the monstrous reptile now so much bigger than before. Even from the satellite's current overhead angle, SCP-682 looked like it could now tower over most buildings, save for maybe occasionally tall skyscrapers. What's more, the creature was now thrashing and roaring in the ocean, entering an enraged state now infinitely more devastating thanks to its newfound size. And it was all Parados' fault. Hey! Foster yelled at the restrained GOC operative. We need to get the word out, and the rest of the facility is still on lockdown. Whatever you did to disable communications, reverse it. What good would that do? Parados asked in a blind panic. Look at the size of that abomination now, it'll wipe us all out. Oh God, what have I done? The agent was shocked into silence by a sudden slap. The timid researcher Foster had struck him sharply across the face. Cry about it later, this is on you, but do you want to be part of the solution or keep being part of the problem? Foster yelled, gripping Parados by the collar. I, I can't reverse it, he replied. I blocked all outbound Foundation transmissions. My comm device is the only thing that wasn't affected. Good enough, Foster said, holding a hand out to Baxter, who passed him the confiscated GOC tech. Then you're going to contact the Coalition for us. What for? The Foundation has a joint project we've been working on with them and Hype Brazil for just this sort of occasion, the researcher stated, holding out the device to Agent Parados as the security finally released his arms. If there was ever a time we needed it, it's now. Wait, you mean... Parados finally realized what Foster meant. You're talking about the Dragon Slayer, aren't you? The next hour flew by. Time seemed to be moving faster as the newly mutated SCP-682 swam through the waters of the Pacific. It was traveling in the northwest direction, the collection of Foundation personnel still locked in the command center having projected that it was heading for the nearest landmass, which meant it would reach Hawaii at any moment. Throughout the entire time, Foster, Parados, and Baxter were sending urgent communiques to the Global Occult Coalition, trying to get them to cooperate and engage in contact with the wider SCP Foundation beyond the facility they were currently stuck in. Not one of them knew which was harder, trying to kill an unkillable lizard that had absorbed a nuclear blast, or trying to force the GOC and Foundation to work together without arguing over whose fault this whole mess was. All the while, the towering monstrous reptilian form of SCP-682 was getting closer and closer to its destination. Drawing itself up to its full enlarged height, SCP-682 roared, large enough to block out sunlight and cast an ominous shadow over the Hawaiian coastline. Onlookers watched in terror as the hard-to-destroy reptile rose from the water, bearing down on their shores with the intent to slaughter every living thing on the island. Then, just as SCP-682 neared the landmass, the creature paused. It could hear something getting closer, getting louder as it approached from behind. No, above. And with it came the sound of someone reciting poetry. Before the creature could turn to face its attacker, the piercing metal of the cold iron sword plunged through its scaly back and out through its front. The hard to destroy reptile roared at the searing pain of the stab wound, whipping its tail as it thrashed in its fury. Something heavy and metallic deflected a swipe at the creature's tail. It was a huge, robotic arm of a gigantic, mechanized titan. It was SCP-5514, the Dragon Slayer. 
Controlled by its skilled pilots with a swift, fluid motion, SCP-5514 delivered a brutal backhanded strike to the reptile's snout, staggering the beast while also withdrawing its mighty cold iron sword at the same time. SCP-682 growled in discontent. Even its infamously adaptable healing abilities were halted by a wound from the Dragon Slayer's blade. Watched by the innocent civilians on the island and the Foundation through their satellite above, the kaiju-killing mech assumed a battle-ready stance as the hard-to-destroy reptile reeled back to roar. The moment it opened its sharp-toothed jaws, a fiery atomic blast came spewing forth from SCP-682. It had adapted not only to withstand the nuclear weapon the GOC had used on it, but also developed the ability to unleash a burst of radioactive fire. Within the Dragon Slayer, the pilots braced for impact as the blast struck the outer armor of the mech. Thankfully, through the conceptual engineering used when building it, SCP-5514 was welded to the Earth itself, as well as the very concept of humanity's resilience. That gave it just enough protection against the onslaught of SCP-682's newfound ability. Holding up one arm to defend itself, the Dragon Slayer reached upwards for its rounded, recoiling plasma, the disc it wore as a hat with its free hand. With a spin, it flung the razor-edged weapon at SCP-682 like a frisbee. It collided with the hard-to-destroy reptile, still unleashing its nuclear fire breath, and staggered the crocodilian creature for just a moment, causing its blast to stop. SCP-5514's pilots commanded the mech to charge forward, as the rounded, recoiling plasma disc spun back through the air and returned to the Dragon Slayer's hand thanks to its built-in electromagnets. Within the robotic vehicle, the thousand-word arrows were still loudly reciting their poetry. The mech's strangest weapon was a group of seven people who would rhyme and chant about the death and defeat of the large-scale monsters SCP-5514 was designed to fight. Their voices were being blared out of the Dragon Slayer at loud enough volume to enrage SCP-682 further. It roared again, and then started rushing towards its adversary, the pair of colossal combatants seemingly charging into a head-on collision. As it placed one mechanical foot before the other, huge splashes erupting as its feet impacted the surface of the ocean, the Dragon Slayer opened fire. The Beowulf Sigurd railgun mounted on its shoulder began launching electromagnetic energy bolts at SCP-682. The weapon used anomalously altered gravity to blast its targets. With each hit, the energy projectiles seared through the outer scales of the hard to destroy reptile while making the towering creature dramatically heavier. Each projectile impacted at super-terminal velocities, making SCP-682's already enlarged body feel heavier and slower with every hit. Each step it took seemed to sink deeper under the ocean, waves lapping at the reptile's damaged scales, sea salt washing over its gaping wounds. By the time it was about to clash with the Dragon Slayer, the hard-to-destroy reptile felt such huge forces of additional weight acting on that its whole body was being pushed further and further below sea level, feet sinking heavily into the seafloor below. Still standing upright, SCP-5514 raised its cold iron sword and brought it down in one fell swoop, cleaving the creature's head from its shoulders before wasting no time slicing up what was left of its nuclear enlarged body. Before long, an area of the Pacific Ocean was red with SCP-682's blood. Victorious for now, the Dragon Slayer began gathering up the remains of the hard to destroy reptile before it had a chance to reform its body. From the command center, the Foundation personnel cheered and whooped excitedly. Even Agent Parados found himself overwhelmed with relief. Although he'd been sent with the intention of assisting them in killing the hard to destroy reptile, the mission that the GOC had sent him on had only made the creature more of a threat. For now, at least, it was defeated, although Parados' celebration of the fact was cut short when one of the Foundation doctors tapped him on the shoulder. Excuse me, GOC Agent Parados, isn't it? The man asked. My name's Dr. Bright, and this here is my associate, Dr. Clef. We'd like to have a word with you about the, uh, incident you just caused. Now go and check out SCP-682 Craziest Mutations and Adaptations, and SCP-682 Ways the SCP Foundation Try to Kill the Hard to Destroy Reptile to see some of the extreme lengths the Foundation has gone to in their attempts to kill SCP-682.